My name is Marianne. I'm the Education Director at the Atlantic White Shark Conservancy. The Atlantic White Shark Conservancy is a nonprofit that is based on Cape Cod, uh, which is a region of Massachusetts. Uh, and we work in white shark conservation. So through research, education, and public safety, we are trying to ensure that we have white sharks not just today, tomorrow, next week, we wanna make sure that when all of you who are watching at home grow up and you become shark scientists, there are white sharks out there for you to study. And that maybe once when you're all grown up and you have kids of your own and then they grow up to carry on your legacy of working in shark research, that they also have white sharks uh, that they can study. Because that's what conservation is all about, making sure that we have something not just today, tomorrow, but for future generations. And that's what our organization does. And we are focused on uh, great white sharks, which we call white sharks, but they are the same thing. When you hear us talking about in these videos and we just say white sharks, a white shark is the same as a great white shark. For our lesson today, looking at how sharks move, um, we do have some resources available on our website. So we have a diagram worksheet, uh, and then we also have a review worksheet that goes over all the concepts that we are going to discuss in our lesson today. Um, so those are available for free download on our website. Um, if you, you know, aren't able to print those out at home, no worries at all. Uh, if you want to have a piece of scrap paper nearby, and maybe for some of you at home, if you want to draw your own picture of a shark, then you can make your own diagram on that scrap paper as we go through this lesson today. I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to pull up our PowerPoint for today. And... This is going to take us through, you know, we've had a lot of questions uh, looking at, you know, how do sharks move? And in some of our previous lessons, when we've discussed shark anatomy and, you know, what is a shark and what makes a shark very unique to other fish that live in our oceans, you know, a lot of people have said, well, how do they move? And they move because of their fins, but there's more to it than that, you know, just having their fins doesn't enable them to move. It's how they utilize their fins and utilize their body. So that is our whole lesson for today. We're going to go through and talk about how do sharks move. And as we go through this today, if you want to relax and watch and take everything in, that's perfect. If you want to take some notes today, you know, we do have those worksheets that are available on our website, um, but if you aren't able to print those, again, no worries at all. Why don't you grab a scrap piece of paper? And as we get started today, one of the first things that you can do on that scrap piece of paper is if you want to draw a picture of a shark across the middle here, uh, because then you're going to make, be able to make your own diagram that will help you to learn and look at how sharks move. All right. So through our lessons, we have learned that not all sharks look the same. We have some sharks that are really small, like the dwarf lantern shark. That's one of the smallest species of shark. And that is a shark species that is about the size of your pencil, okay? Um, you know, compared to some of the larger species of shark, largest species in our ocean is the whale shark. You know, all these sharks have the ability to be able to move through the ocean. Uh, in this video here, and uh, this video is a little bumpy because it was taken by me when I was doing some swimming with whale sharks, but you can see how even though this animal is so large, okay, whale sharks can be about the size of your school bus that you take to school, you can see how easily it moves through the water um, and how graceful it is as it actually makes that movement. And as we look back towards the tail of the whale shark as it's swimming there in the water, okay, you can see that that tail is really what's helping this shark to be able to move as it glides through the water. Now, even though the whale shark is an incredibly large species of shark, you know, they do move, as we just saw, they move really well. And we've had some questions about the speed of whale sharks, and it's believed, so through some studies that on average, they're moving about three miles an hour as they make their swim to different places and they move through, okay? So this shows us the movement of the whale shark. And then if we look at this video here, this will show you a white shark as it is moving through the water, okay? And this is a species that as you just saw, even has the ability to move not in the water, but it can break the surface and it can move up and out of the water, okay? Now I know this video goes kind of fast, so we can go ahead and we'll watch this again. 
we're able to see again that movement of the tail on the shark all right that's really what's helping it to move as it moves forward and then it is able to actually launch itself and it can break the surface of the water and it jumped out of the water there okay pretty cool to be able to see right so looking at you know all the different species of shark okay um, and we're talking about how they move one of the first things we have to be aware of is how anything moves in general okay uh, when we talk about motion we got to think about newton's first law of motion which is known as the law of inertia now for some of you at home who might be in kindergarten first grade we're talking about some stuff that's at high school level right now but you know what's really awesome is that when you are back in your classroom and your teacher starts talking about movement and how different animals and living things move you can raise your hand and say are you talking about the law of inertia in your teachers their mind is going to be blown they're going to be so excited to hear you use this reference um but so what the law of inertia states is it's looking at an object at rest stays at rest and an object in motion stays in motion with the same speed and in the same direction unless acted upon by an unbalanced force so when we watched those two videos, you saw how both sharks were moving forward, right? Okay, so that means that there had to have been something that, you know, caused them to actually get into motion and start moving. And when we watched both of those videos, did you see something that both sharks did? What did they have in common? Ah, I'm seeing some comments and some people are talking about at home, how they had that tail movement right okay and that tail movement is definitely a big part of this okay so when we look at the tail of our shark which anyone know what we call that scientifically the caudal fin very good okay when we look at that caudal fin on our shark and if we look at my shark that i have here okay what's going to happen in that caudal fin is going to have that side to side movement okay and when our caudal fins moving side to side the reason it's able to do so, okay, is because of this caudal keel region right here. So this is that caudal keel region, and this has so much muscle right here, and it's really enabling the shark's body to be able to then move the actual caudal fin from side to side. And that side to side movement that's taking place is generating a force. And we call that force the thrust force. Can everyone at home say that for me? thrust force. Very good. So this side to side movement is going to generate that thrust force, which creates a forward movement for our shark. Okay, so by moving its tail from side to side, that shark is in fact going to be able to cruise forward through the water because it's generating that force that's going to set the shark into motion. Okay. So, you know, when we talk about the fins on the shark, enabling the shark to move, we're really looking at how that caudal fin working with the caudal keel area, which is that back section on the shark, okay, generating that side to side movement is going to be able to generate that thrust force for the shark to actually have that forward motion, okay. Now, this really demonstrates you know, what we saw in that video of the whale shark. That whale shark was just kind of cruising along, going straight with that forward motion. But when we looked at that video of the white shark, it wasn't just going forward. It was going forward, but then it also had the ability to go up. So what is it that enables sharks to move up or down in the water column? And this is a different force that we would then look at, okay? When we're talking about the ability for the shark to actually be able to move upward in the water column, that is when we're going to look at a force called lift, okay? And when we talk about lift, this is that shark's ability to be able to actually move upward, all right? When we are looking at the lift for the shark, we really wanna focus in on these arm fins that we have here. Do you know what we call those arm fins on the shark? Pectoral fins, very good. So when we look at that pectoral fin, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here, okay? What's gonna happen that's gonna allow for lift is as the shark is swimming through the water, okay? Some of that water is actually getting pushed beneath the fins of our shark. 
So if I was able to draw my arrow of this picture, actually that brush of water is gonna go underneath, okay, the fin. And by doing that, we're creating different zones of pressure, but that, you know, by pushing that fluid, that water going underneath the fins of our shark, that's then enabling the shark to actually have lift and being able to move upward in the water column, okay? So let's already take a moment to review. When we are looking at this, okay, and we're look looking at how those sharks are going to move, we have our caudal fin with that side to side movement. And that caudal fin is gonna help the shark have that thrust force, that forward movement as it goes through the water, okay? So that side to side movement again generates that thrust force. This is like, um, you know, that the motor on the shark, really getting it to power and move forward. And then for as it starts to move up or down in the water column, you know, as water is rushing underneath those pectoral fins here, okay, then we're creating an imbalance in the pressure and compared to the amount of pressure on top of the fin compared to underneath it. And so as more water pushes underneath those pectoral fins, it's going to enable that lift and the shark is able to move upward in the water column, okay? So, you know, as we look at this thrust and lift, helping the shark to be able to move, um, you know, one of the things that we also have to keep in mind is the shark's anatomy, its regular biology also helps in it being able to move, especially when we're talking about how it moves in an ocean environment. And one of the properties that we've discussed with, you know, that makes sharks unlike other fish is the fact that they have a skeleton completely made out of cartilage. Now, where in your body do you have cartilage? That's right, you have cartilage in your nose. You also have cartilage in your ears, okay? And cartilage is different than bone. So right here, I actually have a piece of shark cartilage. And so this is a piece of the spine on the shark, okay? Sharks are animals that are vertebrates, meaning that they have a spine and their spine is completely made out of cartilage um, compared to, this that I have here, this is actually a piece of whalebone, all right? So this is a fragment of whalebone, very different than the cartilage. Now, sharks don't have any bone in their body. Again, that entire skeleton is made out of cartilage. And when we look at this and we compare cartilage versus bone, one of these is less dense than the other. And this is my little promo for our lesson on Wednesday when we're gonna be looking at density, okay? And some other properties of sharks in their biology that really help them to be able to move well in the water going both up and down, okay? But just for an example today, looking at cartilage versus bone, all right? When I really start feeling these two things, all right? They have a different mass, okay? And so if I were to take these two things and place them in a bucket of water, what do you think is gonna to happen to each of them? We're looking at cartilage compared to bone. And a hint here, okay, we just talked about lift, the shark's ability to be able to actually move upward in the water, okay? Um, so when we're looking at that upward movement, all right, and we're thinking, well, how does their general biology also help them to be able to, you know, be able to move up and down in the water column? We think about cartilage in the water compared to bone in the water. You know, how do you think these two things are going to react differently if I were to place them in water? I want you to go ahead and make a prediction. Okay, a prediction meaning using an educated guess or using your, your previous knowledge, okay, to make an educated guess on what would happen if these two items were placed in the water. Are they going to do the same thing? Yes, no, maybe. Could the cartilage sink and the bone float? Or do you think the bone will sink and the cartilage will float? All right, should we find out? Okay. So I'm gonna take my piece of cartilage and I'm gonna take my piece of bone and I'm actually going to put them into a bucket of water that I have over here, okay? And now if I hold this bucket up into the camera so that you can all see, all right, what are you able to observe? Are they doing the same thing? No, they are not. And I know it's a little hard to see, okay? But if you look at the bucket right now, you're able to see that that bone 
actually sunk to the bottom. And that piece of cartilage is in fact floating at the top. And this is because when we start to look at density later this week, cartilage is less dense than bone, okay? And so again, as we're talking about sharks being able to move through the water, their biology, the makeup, and looking at their body really does help them to be able to move through the water because they have that skeleton made of cartilage. It's less dense than bone. So when they need to generate lift, it's gonna better enable them to do so, okay? Because their skeleton, being fully made out of cartilage is in fact less dense than if they had bone in their skeleton. But again, we're going to get more into density later this week on Wednesday, okay? Oh, and I just had a request here to actually make the screen bigger for a moment so you can better see. So before we move on, I can absolutely do that for all of you folks at home, okay? So now, and actually now the way it's lined up, you can see right over, all right, our cartilage is there floating at the top compared to our piece of bone, okay, which did sink down to the bottom. So hopefully this enables all of you at home to better be able to see how that piece of cartilage is less dense than bone, okay? All right. Have to admit to you guys, it's a little nerve wracking to hold a bucket of water over the computer here. <laughs> All right, so let's get back looking at our lesson then, okay? So, you know, we just talked about thrust and we talked about lift. But if we go ahead and if we revisit Newton's first law of motion, again, all right, it's known as the law of inertia. You can see it referenced both ways. It says an object at rest stays at rest and an object in motion stays in motion with the same speed and in the same direction unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. So the end to that statement, acted upon by an unbalanced force. I want you boys and girls at home to think for a minute. When we've seen videos of sharks and they're swimming through, do they always swim at the same speed? Are they always swimming maybe in the same direction? No, okay. We know that sharks have the ability to turn. And that's where, okay, their pectoral fins can come into play because their pectoral fins are actually going to help them to be able to steer through the water, all right? So their pectoral fins, which we also know help them to generate lift and move upward, okay? Their pectoral fins by moving those can really help them to steer. So then they're affecting that lift force. So that means, you know, we're talking about at being acted upon by something else that can enable them to actually change their direction, all right? So that the shark isn't just gonna continuously swim straight forever and ever and ever, okay? But when we talk about sharks actually maybe slowing down in the water, or even sometimes having the ability to speed up by moving their tail faster, okay? Like we saw in that video of the white shark, that white shark really started generating its tail pretty quickly so that it could generate you know, that lift force and really thrust itself up and out of the water. Um, but there are things that are natural in the ocean environment that are going to be acting against the shark that can cause it to slow down um, and even change its direction a bit. So let's look at those forces that are acting on the shark that affect its movement. So the first one that we're going to look at is called drag, okay? And drag is the force that is acting against the shark. So we know the shark wants to swim forward through the water. It's moving its tail from side to side to generate that thrust force. But drag is acting against it and drag is what can slow a shark down, okay? Now, sharks with their unique body shape are really designed to overcome drag so that they don't get stopped as they're moving through the water. It can cause them, as I said, to slow down. It can definitely affect their ability to move in the water depending on what's going on in the ocean environment with some of the currents it might be swimming in. But when a shark is swimming, it has to break through the water. So one of the first things about the shark that really help it to be able to overcome drag is that nice pointy nose. So when you notice when we look at the picture of our shark here, Okay, and we notice what comes to this fine point. If you really have to puncture and break through something, if you go at it with a really blunt or say a flat surface, it's gonna be a lot harder. Compared to if you come to a nice fine point and you can start to break through, it's gonna be a bit easier. So the shape of the shark's body with that nice pointed nose, 
okay? And then the way it gets bigger and then how it even gets smaller again, this really helps the shark to overcome drag. And we call their whole shape, we say that it's streamlined. Can all you boys and girls say that at home for me? Streamlined, very good. So looking at that streamlined shape of the body, this is gonna help the shark to be able to overcome drag, okay? Um, something else that helps them to overcome drag is actually the scales on the shark's body. So sharks have dermal denticles, uh, also known as placoid scales. In these scales, when you look at this picture that we have here, okay, you can see how there are ridges there. It's not just flat. And by having those ridges, it actually is going to help water to move more quickly over the shark, okay? Um, so their whole body is covered with those scales. And by having those ridges, it does enable water to better move over the scales on the shark. And again, it's the streamlined shape of their body, the scales that they have. This is going to help them to generate that thrust force to really break through and overcome drag, which is going to cause them, you know, to want to slow down. Now, if a shark isn't moving its tail back and forth as much and isn't generating that thrust force, then drag can cause that shark to be able to slow. So the shark by moving its caudal fin really has to generate enough thrust force to overcome drag to have that forward motion through the water, okay? The other force acting on our shark is gravity, okay? Gravity affects everything here on earth, whether it's on land or in the ocean, okay? So gravity is being that force that wants to hold everything here on earth. That's gonna be that downward pulling force. So when we look at gravity, what do you think the shark has to do to overcome gravity so it isn't constantly being pulled down to the ocean floor? Lift, excellent, okay? So you can see how by getting water underneath the shark's pectoral fins here and being able to generate that lift force, that's gonna help the shark being able to overcome gravity and move up in the water column. And then if they don't have that upward, okay, if they start to flat or turn down, then that's when gravity is going to help to pull them back down if they need to go down to deeper depths, okay? So let's go back and let's take a look at all of those forces, all right, that are either acting on the shark or that the shark is generating to allow movement here, okay? So we know, as we just said, gravity is acting on the shark, all right, just like everything else here on Earth. If I drop my pencil, we know it's gonna fall because gravity is pulling it down, okay? So even in our ocean, gravity is that downward force acting on the sharks. And then we also have drag, okay? So drag is, you know, another force that sharks have to overcome because drag is, you know, that resistance that the shark is facing as it's trying to actually move forward because our ocean is a fluid, okay? And so the shark has to be able to break through that fluid to have any kind of movement. And so that resistance there, that is that drag that is being created. So to overcome drag, that's where the shark is gonna use the muscles in its caudal keel area. And it's gonna have that side to side movement of its caudal fin to generate that thrust force, that forward movement, okay? And so that the shark doesn't always just be going down, down, down to the depths of our ocean, you know, being pulled by gravity, the shark is going to generate that lift force. So that's that upward with fluid going underneath their pelvic fins and underneath its body. That's gonna help that shark be able to actually move upward in the water column, okay? So for all of you at home who have been making a diagram, I'm sure you've got arrows and these words going in different directions, okay? But hopefully this was able to illustrate to you a bit better on how it is that sharks are able to move in their water. Okay, you see, absolutely, it has to do with their fins, but it's the actions that their fins take, all right, and how their caudal keel works to help them that really allows them to have this movement in the water, okay? And when we are talking about these forces and we're talking about movement, all right, we talk about it in terms of a shark, but this is really how airplanes work as well, okay? When we're looking at an airplane, as you can see in this picture here, an airplane, all right, absolutely has to overcome gravity. So an airplane starting on the ground, on the runway, all right, something's gonna have to happen. Otherwise, gravity's gonna wanna keep that 
plane on the ground at all times, right? As well as, you know, air is a fluid, just like when we talk about our sharks living in the ocean, right? The ocean is a fluid, but air itself is a fluid as well. And so there is, you know, that force and that resistance of drag that the plane has to overcome to be able to start moving. So what is it, if you've ever been on an airplane before, that happens that allows the plane to actually start moving? Engines, right? So even though the plane does have a tail to it, that tail doesn't have a side to side movement like our shark does, but they do have an engine, okay? So when those engines fire up, the plane usually starts to move forward, correct? Yeah. And so we have that, I think I'm blocking, um, there we go. So when we have that, you know, the engines start kicking on, it's the engines on a plane that generate the thrust force. So those engines are gonna kick in and that's gonna enable the plane to start moving forward. And as the plane is moving forward, if you've ever really looked at the wings, they're on a special tilt. And that allows that unequal air pressure to be created. So then lift can happen, okay? When we actually on our planes have lift off, okay? And so once that lift is created from that forward movement, then we get air underneath the wings on the airplane there. Now my shark's being used as an airplane. Um, but we get that, um, that unequal air pressure. So then air is getting underneath the wings and then it's gonna enable those planes to lift off. And if we look at our plane and we look at our shark, they have a pretty similar shape to them, don't they? We have that nice pointed nose, right? And then it usually gets wider before it thins out again back on the tail. So both a plane and a shark have that streamlined look to their body. And there are engineers who have used the shape and what they know about sharks to help better design airplanes so that they are more streamlined because they know all right, engineers know that sharks can move really well through a fluid. So they wanna make sure airplanes can move really well through a fluid. So they've actually used the shape and design of sharks to better help them design airplanes so that they can move fast through the air, okay? So on your worksheets, one of the questions, you know, is looking at things that are streamlined, things that are designed to actually be able to move quickly through the water. Um, you know, so hopefully you can brainstorm a list and maybe talk with your family about other things, whether they're living or non-living, that have to generate a thrust force so that they can move forward, um, that maybe have to overcome gravity. You know, some things have to move on land, all right? So they might not have to uh, generate a lift force to be up in the air, but hopefully you can generate a list because when we start talking about movement, you know, overcoming drag and generating a thrust force is something that many things have to be able to do in order to move, okay, for today. So as we brought our lesson to a close and we looked at, you know, forces, we started talking about airplanes and even looked at how, um, you know, when we are thinking about airplanes, um, that they have to generate a thrust force, they have to overcome drag, you know, and then looking at how airplane designers, you know, the engineers who have built modern day airplanes, they actually looked at the shape of sharks to be able to better design airplanes because they realized that a shark's body really does have an incredible streamlined shape to their body, okay? Now, if you were with us last week, we made toilet paper sharks. We used our recycled toilet, our empty toilet paper rolls and we cut out some fins and we made a toilet paper shark. Now, looking at this, do we think our toilet paper shark has a very streamlined approach to it? No, probably not. Because we used a toilet paper roll, okay? When our, if we were trying to toss our toilet paper shark and actually see if it can fly, then, you know, that air is gonna come through the middle here because my fins on mine are really upward, I don't think it's gonna help generate that lift. It would be better if they were maybe a bit down and even on an angle, that would really help to generate that lift force. So our activity for today and my challenge for all of you at home is for you to design your own paper airplane, but make it sharky, okay? Now, I'm not the best at making paper airplanes. Um, you know, my knowledge of making a paper airplane is really one of the basic where if I take my paper and because I'm doing it holding it up might not be the best folds here so bear with me and I bend in towards the middle here now there are some really great YouTube videos on all different styles and ways that you can make an airplane 
Um, but one that I know is you take your top corners and just fold them into the middle here. And then if we take it and you fold your paper in half like this down the middle. So notice now my airplane that I'm making thus far, and we talk about that streamlined shape. Now I'm gonna have a nice point to my airplane, right? So that's gonna help in breaking through and reducing drag, you know, getting that going um, by having that nice point that can break through the fluid, which would be air. And now what I'm gonna do is I do need some wings or some fins. So I'm gonna fold down the side here. Now this is where I'm just gonna lift it off my board because I'm gonna have to fold the other side. So I'm gonna lean down on my table for a moment to do. All right, so I have an air, my paper airplane. Again, it's not the most fancy, um, but one more time for those of you at home. So what I started out by doing is I took my two corners and I folded them in towards each other at the middle. Okay, and you can even see, not a perfect fold. And then I folded the entire thing down the middle here. And then I generated, I had to make some wings. So hopefully I will generate that lift force, right? I wanna make sure that I have something so that air can get underneath here to help it actually move upward. Um, and for me, I don't have an engine on here, nor do I have a tail to be able to generate that thrust force. So with a paper airplane, how do you generate a thrust force? You are the thrust force, that's right. So by using my hands, I can launch it as that thrust force and hopefully air will get underneath my wings to generate that um, lift, okay? And to be able to go uh, upward. And because I made that nice pointed nose on it, hopefully it's streamlined enough to help it overcome drag and actually be able to move forward. Now, my challenge, as I said, was how can you make it sharky? So, you know, there are all different ways that you can make a paper airplane, but maybe you could add a dorsal fin to yours so that maybe that'll help it to balance. I know sometimes when I actually fly my paper airplanes, they get knocked over a bit and they don't stay upright. Um, if you wanted to add a tail to it, you can absolutely add a tail. And maybe instead of having long wings like this down the side, you can cut into your paper airplane a bit so they look more like pectoral fins, okay? And if we're really gonna make it sharky, maybe you're gonna put some gill slits on the side here, all right? You can be as creative as you want, but since we're starting to maybe see some nicer weather, once you have actually built or designed and then built your paper airplane, go outside and test it, okay? You can use a piece of chalk or use a stick, use a rock and put your starting point where you're gonna stand and then launch your shark plane through the air and then go and put a marker wherever it landed, okay? Maybe yours went 10 feet. If you wanna measure exactly how far it went, ask an adult at home if you can borrow a tape measure or a ruler, okay? Maybe yours only goes two feet, okay? That means you might have to go back and revisit your design to your shark plane, which is what engineers do all the time, okay? When we actually look at the engineering and design process, it's all about generating ideas, and then you know, taking those ideas, putting them into a plan, and then building a prototype, and then actually testing it out to see how it works. And if that prototype doesn't perform how you anticipate it to or how you want it to, you go back and you brainstorm and you redesign. So if your plan isn't going as far as you want it to, go back and think, how can I improve on my design? And then go out and test it again. Did your plan go farther? Okay, when you redesign and maybe you adjust your fins, maybe sometimes it can be helpful to use an adhesive, whether it's tape to hold your fins together um, or glue. Sometimes people like to put a paper clip or something with a bit of weight somewhere on their airplane um, just to help balance out because of how the paper might affect the distribution of things. So there are lots of different things that you can try to redesign but keep going back and trying it and see if you can improve your shark plane. And we'd love to hear from you on how far you're able to get your shark plane to actually fly, okay? So this is where we are going to come to an end with our lesson today. Uh, we hope everyone enjoyed, you know, viewing with us and learning about how sharks move. And we wish everyone good luck with their shark airplanes that they're able to design at home, okay? 
This is Marianne. I want to thank you again for joining us today. And I hope everyone gets outside and enjoys the beautiful weather we are seeing. Thank you. Have a good one, guys.